Previously on anatomy, we've discussed the anatomy of the ear. We went through the external ear, going through all of its parts. We went through the middle ear. We discussed those different bones that are inside. We talked about how I kind of think of it like the Morse code machine. And then hopefully you guys watched this little video that explained how sound is working, how it travels through our ears. And that's really what we're going to be focusing on today is the physiology behind these things. How do we hear? What is sound? And uh, before we even talk about that, though, we have to talk a little bit about the semicircular canals. That's the one part about the bony labyrinth that we didn't discuss yesterday. And so let's pick up there first. All right, so the semicircular canal, that is the part of the bony labyrinth in which we find our sense of balance, our equilibrium, you could say. You see what's going on is within these chambers, there's a fluid known as endolymph, all right? This endolymph is going to be tossed and turned and move around as we move. Uh, let me show you an example real quick. So this beaker here is basically going to represent our semicircular canals with our endolymph fluid in it. We have some soap in here and that's going to represent that fluid. Now you can notice that again, the speaker has uh, different lines for different measurements. This line right here, that straight line, that means that we're standing upright. What happens if we tilt our head back though? All right, so we're looking up at the sky. Notice how that fluid has changed and a large mass of it is now back here. What if we look down? All right, notice how that fluid has changed. Again, what's going to happen is as that fluid is moving inside the semicircular canals, it's going to alert the brain wherever it's going to trigger that neuron at. Oh, I'm looking up now. Oh, I'm looking down now. Oh, something's happening to me and I don't know what it is. And now I'm going to get very sick. That's basically what's going on inside your semicircular canals. All right, so you see just like the little demonstration there, as we are moving up and down, uh, it's not going to be like water, but nonetheless, that endolymph fluid is going to be moving, sloshing around inside of our ears. And as it moves, it's going to trigger these nerves here. And these nerves are going to then send that signal on up to the brain so it can be processed, whether we're looking up, whether we're looking down, whether we're uh, spinning around. Now, what do you think is going to happen uh, if you are spinning around? Let me show you that real quick as well. So what I'm about to do is 100% for science. Uh, this is our first test run, so let's see. Going, spinning around, spinning around, and now I am feeling really sick and dizzy, but I gotta keep spinning, keep spinning, keep spinning, and now I'm gonna try and get up, and, um, well, I can, I can kind of stand, but I'm, my head is still trying to orient itself, because again, those semicircular canals, they're all messed up now, and it's all because of something known as centrifugal force. And uh, to explain that, let's go outside. All right, so we're out here to explain what centrifugal force is. Uh, as you're spinning around, like I was spinning around in the chair, centrifugal force is happening within my ears, within the semicircular canals. And that fluid, it's all messed up because, um, well, we're just going to see what's going on with that fluid with this bucket of water here. So I don't know if you can hear it. Oh, maybe you saw that. There is some water in here. And what I'm going to do with it is I'm going to take this bucket and I'm going to spin it around where the bucket is completely upside down and hopefully I won't get wet in the process of doing this. All right, here we go. There we have it. And just to prove to you that there was water in the bucket, Ta-da! Science. Alright, so you can see as we're spinning around, because of that centrifugal force, all that fluid is just kind of going to be going everywhere. It's going to be really confusing for your brain to process. And that's why you can feel really dizzy after you've spun around, is because your brain really can't orient you. It's having a hard time figuring out where you are. Are you up? Are you down? Are you still moving? And that's even how we get motion sickness. Uh, for example, think about yourself on a boat. If you're standing still on that boat, but the waves are rocking that boat back and forth, back and forth, 
your brain knows based off your body that you're standing still. However, because the boat is rocking back and forth, back and forth, so is that fluid inside of your ear. And so that's how you get seasick. It's very similar to how we get car sick as well. For example, if you are driving somewhere, you're sitting down and generally your body feels stationary. And it's even going to feel stationary within the semicircular canals. That fluid's not really going to be moving around. It's just going to be stationary. However, your eyes are telling you a different story. Your eyes, when you look out that car window, show you that the world is moving on around you. And so that's another reason that you can feel really sick is because, again, it's those two senses that aren't getting along. And so they have to uh, cope with that somehow. And sometimes the brain just can't process that. And that's what motion sickness is. So what I want to talk about here is specifically how do we hear? You know, what's going on? And before we even get to these notes, you can go ahead and jot these notes down right now. But it's important that we talk about sound waves, what sound is. Because the first thing it tells us here is vibrations from sound waves move the tectoral membrane. And we're going to come back to what this is as well. But first of all, I think we need to focus on what these sound waves are. So let's look at that. All right, so here we can clearly see this uh, image here has these what look like sound waves hitting our ear. But what are sound waves even? If you remember from yesterday when uh, I told you guys to move your hands back and forth and you could feel that air moving in between it, all right? We talked about how there's air everywhere and it has mass and it has pressure. And what sound waves basically are it's any vibration that travels through the air. And so uh, you might be able to hear this. I was just tapping on the laptop. And so as I was hitting the laptop, it was causing vibrations. Those vibrations would travel through the air. And then uh, as they traveled through the air, eventually your oracle or your pinnae would pick them up and then it would get sent through the auditory canal and then to the three bones of the middle ear, your hammer, anvil, and then to the stirrup or the stapes. Now, once here, it's going to be hitting that tympanic membrane, or sorry, the tech, um, it's going to be hitting that tectoral membrane inside here. So there's that tectoral membrane, and as that tectoral membrane gets hit, it's going to really amplify whatever these sound waves we're sending out. And then our brain is going to be able to process it as sound. So in other words, here's what's going on with our sound waves. All right, so here we can see our sound waves coming into us. So it looks like somebody's playing their guitar here. And then that sound wave is coming through. It comes through the pinnae, or the pinnae, which is our ear, and then through the auditory canal. And you can notice these waves or these sound waves look like they're staying at the same level. All right, that's called our amplitude. And all of a sudden, though, as soon as we get to that hammer, anvil, and stirrup, as those start to send those vibrations through, what do you notice about this amplitude? The amplitude is actually going to increase. All right, and so as this amplitude increases then once it's in our inner ear it can be processed a lot easier in other words these louder sound waves are going to be able to uh, fluctuate that membranous fluid inside the inner ear a lot easier than these ones would and so what's happening is this middle ear these bones here are able to increase the amplitude of the sound wave all right, what in the world is amplitude? What's a sound wave or a frequency? We're going to be hearing these terms in uh, a video that I'm going to show you. And you may have already heard these if you watch the Crash Course video. But if not, here's a basic understanding of it. All right, so first of all, our frequency. Frequency is just the way to say from like one top of the wave to the other. That's one wavelength, all right? or one vibration. You'll hear in one of the videos, they might say cycles per second, all right? From 
one wave crest to the other wave crest, that's a cycle per second. And that's going to determine your frequency. Now, if you increase the amplitude, watch what happens to our wave. Notice the frequency, in other words, the length from wave to wave has practically stayed the same, but it's gotten taller. In other words, it's gotten louder. When we talk about frequency, think about pitch. Is it a high pitch or a low pitch? All right, frequency is the same thing as cycles per second or one vibration. That's the frequency. So higher pitches are going to have shorter wavelengths. Higher frequencies are going to have shorter wavelengths. In other words, from one crest to the other quest, crest is going to be shorter. Now, they can all have differing amplitudes. In other words, this wave right here is going to be a lot louder than this wave, but they're probably going to sound the same. All right, so frequency is the pitch, and amplitude is just how loud that pitch is. Frequency and amplitude. All right, so again, to reiterate what I've already said in the video probably a hundred times, uh, frequency is the pitch or the tone. In other words, when we're looking at it as a wavelength, the frequency is just going to be how close those waves are together. Now, I know it's hard to see the board, uh, but I've drawn a frequency up here. It's a high frequency because uh, the waves are very close together. All right, what does a high frequency or a lot of cycles per second mean? It means this. It's a high pitch note. All right, your high pitches have the high frequency. In other words, the wavelengths are going to be shorter. Your low frequencies, they're going to be long waves, long, low waves. Now, the amplitude, how high those waves go, not how close they are together, but how high the waves are, depend on, again, loudness. So I'm going to start with my high frequency and I'm going to start slowly increasing the amplitude. All right, notice how I start to increase that amplitude. In other words, it got louder. And so uh, on our diagram here, it would have started with our low amplitude and it would have gotten louder. So the amplitude, the waves would have got higher. All right. so. Here it has it actually starting out high and going low. So let's do that. Another thing to notice, only the amplitude changed. Uh, the note might have sounded a little bit different based off the way I was holding it, but nonetheless, it's still supposed to be the same note, the same frequency, the same pitch. All right, and again, high pitch, Low pitch. Ta da! So, we're going to test out your hearing. We're going to see if you're better at hearing high pitches or low pitches. Some of you guys might remember this from a couple years ago the Yanny or Laurel. Uh, some people heard the word Yanny when they heard this clip, some people heard the word Laurel when they heard the clip. Uh, this video is going to explain some of the science behind that, and it's going to tell you the true answer. What is actually being said on the recording? In the link, you'll or in the description, you'll also find a link that will take you to a uh, web article where you can change the frequency yourself to try it, uh, see if you can hear Yanny or Laurel. All right, and then after that, uh, we're going to do another hearing test, and. In this hearing test, they're going to be able to guess your age range based off your hearing, and it's going to explain what's going on. Why is it that sometimes when we get older, we can't hear higher frequencies? And then last but not least today, 
what I want you to do is watch this video. Now, again, the link is in the description, but if you have access to the Google Slides, it's probably going to be easier for you if you go through the Google Slides, do presentation, and then press play. Because uh, if you look at this video on YouTube, this screen right here will actually just only take up a little small portion of your screen uh, the way this was uploaded to YouTube. So I had to zoom in on it for us for our presentation. So if you want to watch it, you can do it through there. And you need to watch this because you're actually going to find questions. That's what number 18 is in your notes. They are questions uh, that relate to this video. I've already talked about number three because uh, he doesn't explain it in this video, but he'll talk about cycles per second. Uh, question number three asks, what is a cycle per second? We're talking about the frequency, all right? The frequency of a pitch from one wave to the other. That's a cycle per second. And so uh, go ahead, watch this video, try and answer all the questions to the best of your ability. And then tomorrow, uh, on Friday, I will go through these questions. I'll post a video or during a live stream and we'll discuss the answers to uh, number 18 on your notes. All right? So this is just another little video. It's, a, it's just a segment of the last video, so you don't have to watch that. But if that other one doesn't work, this is here. And then let's go back now finally to what we start with, the mechanism of hearing. How do we hear? All right, so after all that, what is the process of all this coming through our ears? How do we actually hear? Well, we already know the process through the external and the middle ear, but what we're really going to be looking at now is what goes on in that inner ear. And so as those vibrations from the stapes are hitting that cochlea, those sound waves are amplified. We already talked about that and what that means. And as those sound waves are amplified, they're going to be moving that tectoral membrane within the cochlea. Now, this is kind of like that membranous fluid. And so there's going to be like this fluid inside your ear. And as that fluid moves, uh, it's going to be moving in different ways depending on the frequency of those vibrations. So high frequencies are going to move this tectoral membrane to trigger hair cells that pick up high frequency sounds. Low frequencies are going to move the tectoral membrane in a way that triggers uh, hair cells for low frequency sounds. Now, if you watched the last video, we talked about the ultra low sound waves, some of those ones that we cannot hear. Those ultra low sound waves, they're not going to trigger an action potential. Now, what an action potential is, we have to think back to the nervous system when we were talking about that with uh, the sodium and the ion, the sodium potassium ion channels, how it was allowing things in and out. Uh, long story short, if you remember, we talked about like a fly landing on you. All right. If the fly is light enough, you're not going to feel it because it didn't start an action potential. But if it's a big enough insect, you're going to feel it crawling on you because it triggered a neuron to send a signal through all the way up to your brain. It's the same thing with our hearing. So in other words, if a sound is within the frequency range that we can hear, uh, anywhere from 20 to 20,000 hertz, if it's within that frequency, it's going to trigger an action potential that triggers the cochlear nerve and that sends the impulse to the temporal lobe where it's then processed by your brain. Now, if this continues to happen, uh, what we call continued stimulation, this can lead to adaptation. All right? Now, adaptation is simply this. All right? It's adapting. Plain and simple, you can see it there. What do I mean by that, by adapting? Uh, think of it as the Febreze commercials, where you see the person. Uh, they might be in like their bedroom or something like that, and it says, you think it smells fine, but everybody else smells this. You've gone nose blind, they say. In other words, that person has gone into sensory adaptation with their smell. 
Likewise, we can have sensory adaptation that occurs with our hearing. For example, it's probably going on for you right now. Your air conditioner might be on, or there might be a TV on in the other room, or you have a fan on, and it's producing audible sound. It's sending those frequencies through the air. However, your brain is smart enough to realize that's not what I'm focusing on, so I'm just going to drown it out. And that's another way that you can think of adaptation. What is adaptation? It's when we adapt to the surroundings to where we can just drown out all the background noise and focus on what we need to. And so I hope you were able to adapt to the sounds around you for while we went through this today. And uh, if you have any questions about how we hear or how we feel balanced, feel free to leave those in the comments. And uh, I'll talk to you guys later.